Okay, our next lesson is all about something called inflation. And we mentioned inflation just briefly in our last uh, lesson because we started talking about something called the macro monster. Now, again, the macro monster isn't a real monster, but I like to think of him as being a monster because it's, as you can see again, a two-headed monster. And it, it's made up of two big problems, unemployment and this thing called inflation. Now, in our last lesson, we learned about unemployment and we decided that we need to know our enemy very well before we can actually go and fight inflation and unemployment. So we already learned about unemployment. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about the other half of the macro monster, inflation. And again, what is the macro monster keeping us from? This, this term we learned about in our last unit called full employment. All right. Now, what we're not going to do today is we're not going to talk about why inflation occurs, just like we didn't talk about why unemployment occurs. What we are going to talk about is what it is and why it's such a concern. And that's kind of our goal for today's lesson. So we're going to learn about our enemy, inflation. To do that, we need some basic information, including a definition. The definition is very simple. Inflation is a general rise in prices. Uh, and I always think of this McDonald's as a good example, right? Clearly, uh, this is a picture taken from back in the 1950s or the 1960s when hamburgers were 15 cents. It would be very hard to find a hamburger today for 15 cents. In fact, I think you'd be uh, a little suspicious of the hamburger if you did find one for 15 cents. So inflation is a general rise in prices. The reason that hamburgers today are no longer 15 cents, they're quite a bit more, is because of inflation. Now, just quickly, I will mention the opposite of inflation, deflation which is a general decrease in prices, though generally we don't talk about deflation nearly as much, uh, mostly because deflation uh, doesn't occur as often. Inflation is normally the thing that we worry about uh, and is most much, much more common. So we'll stick with inflation for right now. And again, what is inflation? A general rise in prices. And there's a couple ways to think about it. We could either say that something that used to cost a a 15 cents now costs a dollar, but another way to think about it would be this. You used to be able to buy five cheap cheeseburgers for a dollar. Now you can only buy one. In other words, your dollar doesn't buy as much as it used to buy. That's what occurs when inflation occurs. All right. Now, why do we worry about inflation? Well, there's a couple reasons. The first one was, is something what I just mentioned a minute ago, which is that the value of the dollar is worth less. Your money doesn't buy as much as it used to when inflation occurs. And that creates uncertainty for people. If people have money, or they're thinking about what their money is going to look like in the future, but they are afraid that inflation is going to be very bad, they can't really know what their money is going to be worth or what it's going to buy in the future. And therefore, it's very, very difficult to make decisions. And as we know, economists like to have information when they make decisions. They want people to be able to have as much information as possible. Inflation destroys information about the future. We don't know what things will be worth if we're concerned inflation is going to happen. And in the worst case scenarios, what you can see here, these two pictures are famous examples of what we call hyperinflation, where uh, the one picture on the left there happens to be Germany during the 1920s. Money Inflation was so bad and money was worth so little that literally children would start picking it up and making, uh, making toys out of it as they're stacking them like blocks. And the picture here on the, on the right is a gentleman actually sweeping the money off the street. That's how little it was worth by this point. Um, we hopefully will never experience inflation uh, in this country at that great a level. But even smaller versions of this can be a real problem for people because they simply don't know what their money is going to be worth. And one of the things it does is it destroys savings. Anybody who has money, if inflation occurs, that money is worth less. So if you've spent your entire life saving thousands and thousands of dollars, and all of a sudden, terrible inflation occurs, that $1,000 isn't worth nearly as much as you thought it was going to be. So for all of these reasons, economists worry a great deal about inflation. Specifically, who's hurt by inflation? Well, simply put, anyone who has money. If you have money and inflation occurs, your money is simply worth less 
less. So that obviously includes people who have savings. If you've saved a lot of money and inflation occurs, that savings will not buy as much as it would have when you first put it into the bank. That's not a good thing. Now, hopefully, in most cases, people try to get interest on their savings to make up for some of that inflation. But the reality is if the inflation went too fast and their interest didn't keep up with it, their money would be worth less. That's also why banks are so concerned about money, because what do banks do? They loan money to people. And think of it this way. If you got a loan from someone, suppose that you gave a bank gave someone a $100 loan. Well, the bank gave them a $100 loan and said, you have to pay it back in five years. Well, if in that five years, a tremendous amount of inflation occurred, or even a small amount of inflation occurred for that matter, that $100 wouldn't be worth as much as it was when the bank gave it out in the first place. So when they got it back, yes, they would get $100 back, but it wouldn't be worth as much. Again, obviously banks charge interest for loans partly to make up for that fact. But if more inflation occurred than they thought was going to occur, the bank would be getting money back that was worth much less, and that wouldn't work out well for the bank. Um, people who are on fixed incomes, if you get, uh, for example, if maybe if you're on a pension from your job uh, after you retire, and every month you get a check for maybe $1,000 to live on, well, every time inflation occurs, that $1,000 buys less and less and less. This is also a concern for people who have contracts that they've saw, signed for a long time period. And why would that be? Well, if you think about it, if suppose somebody uh, signed on for a new job and decided to sign a five-year contract, well, they kind of have to guess what inflation is going to be five years down the road because they have to decide now how much money they want to agree to for this job. If they agree, agree to a certain amount of money five years down the road, but during that five years, a lot of inflation occurs, that money is worth less than it would have been if that inflation didn't occur. So people who sign contracts for a long period of time have to take guesses about inflation. Um, and usually, uh, if inflation goes, or not always, if inflation goes much too high, then those contracts won't be worth as much as the people who signed them thought they were going to be. So all of these folks, guys, worry a great deal about inflation. And because all these folks worry about it, economists worry about it as well. There is, however, one group that likes inflation. And you can probably figure out based on this last slide who it is. It's people who borrow money. Now, why would somebody who borrows money like inflation so much? Because when inflation occurs, remember, it makes money worth less. Well, that's good if you're borrowing money. So if you were the person who borrowed that $100 from the bank and you waited five years and a lot of inflation occurred, You'd still be giving them $100, but that $100 wouldn't be worth as much. It wouldn't buy as many things as it used to. And therefore, in a sense, you're not really paying back as much. Um, if you look at this cartoon here on the right, this is a very famous cartoon from back in the uh, late 1800s. Uh, it, it referenced a, a movement called the Free Silver Movement. And without getting into a lot of detail, the farmers, the gentleman here hanging by the signpost, farmers at the time wanted the U.S. government to make silver uh, into money as well as gold. And what that would have done, uh, without getting into details here, is it would have caused inflation. Why did they want inflation? They wanted inflation so badly because they owed a lot of money on their land to the banks. And they knew, they knew that if they could cause inflation, then what they would be paying back to the banks would be worth much, much less. Um, by the way, as it turns out, that movement didn't work out. You can see the farmer got left hanging. But this is why, again, banks worry about inflation, and people who owe money uh, are actually helped by inflation. So, for example, if you owed a credit card uh, bill, and inflation occurred from the time that you borrowed the money to the time you paid it back, you'd actually be paying back less. So most people in our situation here are hurt by inflation, but anybody who borrows money, being the big exception, is actually helped. All right, now we need to know two terms. You keep hearing me say something like, yes, you still pay the $100 back, but it's not worth as much. It seems like we should have some terms for that, and of course we do. So let's get some of these terms down. The first one we want to learn is what's called the nominal value. The nominal value is the actual value of the currency. So if I get a $100 loan and I pay back that 
the nominal value is a hundred dollars okay if I have a dollar bill that says a dollar on it the nominal value is a dollar the nominal value is the actual value printed on the money that's the actual amount okay there's a distinction between nominal values and real values in nominal values five dollars is equal to five dollars but a real value which is the one we're gonna focus on the real value is the amount of goods and services that a currency can buy you so if we're talking about real values I wouldn't say that five dollars equals five dollars what I would say is for example five dollars maybe equals two gallons of gasoline that's a much more real thing I know that five dollars at that moment in time can buy me two gallons of gasoline and if in the future that five dollars can't buy me that much gasoline I know that inflation has occurred even though that five dollars still looks the same I know it's not worth as much so for example if inflation happens nominally five dollars is still equal to five dollars that that amount hasn't changed but really the real value of that five dollars is only one gallon of gasoline it's not worth as much and so I know that inflation has occurred what do economists want to know about we want to know about real values we want to know about real values because what we assume is that a gallon of gasoline a real thing is going to be worth the same to somebody in the 1980s as it is in, in 2000 the price may have changed because the nominal value has changed but that thing is still worth the same amount so if we're going to compare from year to year to year to year we want to look at real values things that are consistent across time and maybe a, an example with a chart will help explain why the distinction between these two things and why they're important okay here's an example of nominal oil prices and real oil prices since the 1970s now you often heard in the news uh, around 2006 that oil prices that hit the highest they'd ever hit ever well in one sense that was actually true um, as you can see from the chart in 2006 the price of a barrel of oil was sixty dollars and it had never been that high before so in a sense that's true but I guarantee you if you ask somebody who lived in the 1970s they would say yeah the gasoline technically cost sixty dollars a barrel but it doesn't seem as expensive as it did back in the 1970s and it turns out they'd be right because look back to the 1970s well, actually before we do that look at 2006 real value the real value of it was only about 32 or 33 dollars a barrel and if I slide all the way back to the 1970s you'll notice that at its peak the, the highest real value the gray line oil cost more forty dollars a barrel in the late 1970s early 80s than it did in 2006 and if you ask someone who lived them like I said they would tell you it felt more expensive in the 1970s why because yeah the actual amount on your dollar was higher but that dollar was worth more so when you gave it away for your gasoline in the 1970s you were giving up a lot more than you were given when you gave it away in 2006 knowing the difference between those two things allows someone today for example to say oh I'm making a great salary this year you're making much more than you did but it, so for example if I said to uh, maybe maybe uh, a son says to his father dad I'm making a lot more money than you do I make ten thousand dollars today and you only made five thousand dollars twenty years ago well again a nominal value that's true but the question we have to ask is what did that five thousand dollars buy for his dad and what did that ten thousand dollars buy for the son and there's a very good chance because of inflation that five thousand dollars actually bought more back in the day than that ten thousand dollars does now we want to know what the value it bought is what's the real value and one more example of why real versus nominal is important to understand take a look at movies now if somebody wanted to claim what's the highest selling movie of all time they could obviously conclude that it was Avatar in 2009 Avatar sold 760 million dollars in tickets that's a lot of tickets and, and that seems pretty fair um, Titanic sold 658 million dollars in tickets but these are all nominal values these are the actual dollars amount as they were sold in the year the movie was produced um, so even just looking at this chart 
I think most people would intuitively think that Star Wars, the original Star Wars in 1977, was a bigger hit than Avatar. Avatar was a big hit, but Star Wars, the original, was a humongous hit. So is it possible that the $460 million that Star Wars made in 1977 was actually worth more than the $760 million that Avatar made in uh, 2009? Actually, as it turns out, that's actually true. It was worth more. Here's another way of looking at it. Here are the 10 highest films when we do adjust for inflation and we have real values now. According to this, if we were to take the exact same dollars today, Gone with the Wind, which was made way back in 1939, would have actually made $3.3 billion. $3.3 billion. Now, Avatar also would have made a lot of money, $2.7 billion. But it turns out Gone with the Wind is actually was actually a bigger hit, had more value in the money that it made, uh, than Avatar was. Um, and actually, Titanic, as you can see, uh, slides down a little bit in the overall rank. And as we said, no big surprise, Star Wars jumps way up. It's almost equal to what Avatar was. So this is why it's important. And, and if we think about it, which one really makes more sense to us? We know for, on the right that Gone with the Wind, Star Wars, The Sound of Music, those were all the biggest movies in history. Nominally, they don't look like that. But once we factor in inflation, then we can say, really, these are the values we want to know. So the lesson here, folks, is anytime we have nominal values in this class, we're going to try to turn them into real values. In our next lesson, we'll learn how to do that.